Thompson here in the driver's seat talking all things Texas A&M. When was the last time we had a fan friction day? This is going to be the episode. I always get asked questions from people around the SEC, around the game itself, about A&M, about the entire conference, what they mean to each other. So today, we're going to answer those questions. This episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by rockauto.com. RockAuto.com is an online auto parts service system that has been serving customers for the past 20 years. Go to RockAuto.com and type in Locked On on the How'd You Care About section so they know that we sent you. Amazing selections, reliably low prices, all the auto parts you will ever need. RockAuto.com is the place to be. As always, make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson. I am the host of the show and I love public feedback. Anything you can do to help make this a more quality sounding podcast Monday through Friday, every single day is a Locked on Aggies podcast day. I'm always up to listen to the conversation. And secondly, Locked on Aggies. Locked on Aggies is your number one source for all things 12th main related content found here on the Locked on Podcast Network. Subscribe on iTunes, listen on Spotify, and if you can't do any of that, listen live at LockedOnPodcast.com. So, Texas A&M is going into this weekend against the likes of Arkansas, and Halloween is coming right around the corner. So, before we go actually answer some of these questions, I want to figure out what would be some fun names for A&M players to be spooky or scary that you kind of put them to. Uh, one name that I've always thought of is whenever I think of slasher movies, such as Scream, such as uh, I-, I would go with uh, Friday the 13th, Freddy Krueger, uh, and Nightmare on Elm Street. I try to find players who kind of remind me of them. So with Jason, I think you got to go with DeMarvin Leal because of right now he is slashing and dicing his way through defensive lines, making an impact on the trenches in Mike Elko's scheme. I think he's one of those players who just kind of stands out because of he's a little bit bigger. And any single time you watch the Friday 13th movies, Jason's a lot bigger than any of the other components. Freddy Krueger though, who is known for, killing his opponents in their sleep might be Michael Clemens because Michael Clemens is sending quarterbacks to night night land for what he's able to do in the backfield, his ability to pass rush, his ability to make plays uh, well after the line of scrimmage, bulldozing offensive tackles back, making double teams look like single coverage. It's pretty impressive overall. So I think that you got to go with him there. Leatherface Leatherface is just another kind of guy who steps out of his comfort zone. He's a, he's a dude who, you know, he's known for being Texas proud, Texas big, part of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. So you got to go with someone from the big old D, and that would be Buddy Johnson. Buddy Johnson loves to go ahead and let people know, I am the commander of this defense. I am in control. There is nothing you can do to stop me. That's why I am here today. Now, I go to Scream. Scream is one of those movies that you have a very sneaky killer. He's a guy who kind of hides in the shadows, makes you think he's somewhere, but realizes he's not. Then he jumps out the last second and cuts you and slices you and dices you up. I got to go with Damani Richardson on that one. Damani's a sneaky player. That's the one thing I've noticed about him more than anything else this year is Richardson's ability to hide that he's blitzing and then immediately go back and drop into coverage. Those are things that you just don't expect. You expected him to probably play a little bit more down in the box because of his size, because of his frame. He's actually done a very fantastic job in coverage, having that one interception, of course, also having a couple of big pass breakups, especially against Alabama, uh, against Mississippi State. He's done his part. So I actually think that he fits that scream mentality a little bit more than other people would probably on this team. And last but not least, you have Michael Myers. Now, Michael Myers lets you know exactly what he's doing. He's there to make you scream. And that is where I think you have to go with someone like Jaden Peavy or really Bobby Brown or any one of them could play. I would say Michael Myers in, in, in a slasher movie, because when you look at them, they're just going on the line. They're saying, Hey, I'm here. I'm going to mess you up. I'm going to make sure that whatever happens on this play ends with you in pain. So for me, That's exactly what Michael Myers is. He doesn't hide a lot. He's not trying to be one of those sneaky characters. He's just trying to be as menacing as possible, let you know, I am here for a reason. Don't give me a reason to end it. And both of them in that defensive tackle position are showing reasons why they're just here to end it. 
Guys, this episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by rockauto.com. Now, rockauto.com is an online auto parts service system that's been serving customers for the past 20 years. And it's more than just because of you have to go into the store and you have to find a actual part, then install it yourself or pay for someone to do it. But you actually have on rockauto.com a bunch of different models, parts made for different areas. So if you're trying to renew a older car or just put some parts in your new car, Rock Auto has both. I mean, I've literally changed two of my taillights out just by going to rockauto.com, going through their catalog, finding the part that I need for my Audi, which is a little older Audi, not as new as a lot of people think, having it shipped to my house and installing it myself for a fraction of the price. So when you go to rockauto.com, type in locked on on the how to hear about section so they know that we sent you. Amazing selections, reliably low prices, all the auto parts you will ever need. Rockauto.com is the place to be. Let me ask you guys something. Do you ever just feel like you're always on the go, whether that's with social media or friends or family or trying to keep up with all your social status? You never feel like you have time just to chill? Well, when you do have time to chill, I always recommend to grab an ice cold beer. Now, the beer that I recommend the most has to be Coors Light from the Golden, uh, from the Golden Brewing Company out in Golden, Colorado. Now, everyone wants you to know at Coors Light that they are the sport here to fill your Saturdays because they're made to chill. Even if your team's not playing this year, that does not mean that you cannot sit down and enjoy an ice cold beer just to watch football. College football is therapeutic for the fan because of its quality meantime. And when you do chill, it allows you to have a ice cold drink in your hand. That's why I always recommend Coors Light because it's cold lagered, cold filtered, and it's literally made to chill. Cold is in their name. I choose a Coors Light when I want to relax, and I recommend that you choose a Coors Light as well. And you can go get their new delivery service by going to get.coorslight.com. And always remember, celebrate responsibly. Locked on Aggies, presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. Cole Thompson here in the driver's seat, talking all things Texas A&M. Guys, make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson and at Locked on Aggies. And also, let me get your opinion on something. Do you love quality podcasts running your favorite sports teams? If so, why not listen to a Locked On podcast? The Locked On Podcast Network has over two dozen college sports shows, plus every team covered in the NFL, MLB, NBA, NHL, and highlight information to get you geared up to win your fantasy football league. Subscribe on iTunes, listen on Spotify, and if you can't do any of that, listen live on LockedOnPodcast.com. So, like I said, today is just going to be an Ask an Aggies day. It's one of those days where I'm just going to read some questions off of a mailbox that I get asked either via social media, via uh, email, via whatever. Make sure that you're following me at Mr. Cole Thompson to give me more questions because I'd love to answer them. Let's start with the first one. Ags123, send me this by email. Who has been the most impressive Aggie this season through the first four games? It's tough, but I, honestly, I might go with Aaron Hansford. I mean, Hansford is a guy who was a mix of a tight end wide receiver at the very beginning of his career. He moved a linebacker when Fisher got there. He was able to transition well as kind of a special teams player. And then you have to realize Anthony Hines decided to opt out less than a week and a half before the season. I understand Hines' reasoning, and I've always said this. Anthony Hines deserves to do what he wants to do. And if this is the end of his 12th man career, so be it. Good for you, Anthony. I support you. I know a lot of other Aggies out there do. But he left a hole in Mike Elko's 425 system. And Aaron Hansford really has stepped up. He's been a pass rusher. I think he has two sacks on the year. He has over 35 tackles on the year. He has a pass breakup. He helped cause an interception. He's making plays all across the field in a very similar role that you could say Anthony Hines was playing. Also, I think that the biggest thing about it is he's a veteran. You would have Andre White Jr. who's coming in, and there's nothing wrong with a sophomore starting alongside a senior, but you're now putting that much more pressure on the sophomore to be at that same level that a junior was going to be at. And sometimes that's easier said than done because Andre White has played in over 50 or 60 snaps this year, and there's been about five really standout plays, about 25 really forgetful plays that nobody really knows because if he wasn't involved, and then about five really bad plays. So you look at all that, and you wonder, okay, why did they go with a guy who's not going to be here past this year when we could have gone to try and build for the future? Well, if the future is now, which means you're okay with struggling for this year, so be it. But when the future isn't arrived yet, you have to go with what you know. 
And that's why I think Aaron Hansford might be the most improved player this year. If it's not him, it's Michael Clemens. Clemens has done a very good job. He leads the team in sacks. I think he's averaging 0.5 sacks a game. I know he's gotten two in the last two games. I think he's got three in the last two games, if I'm being honest. He's been really impressive. I did not have him in my top 25 Aggies to watch for this year. I was very sorry about that, but I still think Hansford is the guy. This one comes from Brian Murphy on Twitter. If you were to pick a Heisman Trophy winner in the SEC right now, who would it be? Uh, it'd be Mac Jones. I mean, it's not Kellen Mond. I'm sorry, guys. I mean, I think a lot of Aggie fans out there know it's not Kellen Mond. It, it, he's had his moments of really strong play in those big-time throws. He's also had some moments of weakness. I think that Kyle Trask was a name that a lot of people were very high on, and I was very high on too. I think after that A&M game where he played – consistently average the entire time, very similar to what Mon did. He never really made that jump. So it's kind of very similar to what, you know, you see with these quarterbacks in the SEC where they look like they're good, but then they kind of struggle. Mac Jones maybe a, is a product of Steve Sarkeesian and Nick Saban, but he's putting up the numbers. He's putting up quality play. He has a very low turnover ratio. He's very good at controlling a game. That doesn't mean that he's going to be the next big-time NFL prospect. He's not going to go to be a fifth, sixth-round, maybe undraftable player to the number one pick this year. I don't see that happening. I can't see him maybe going the first round because teams are desperate for quarterbacks in the NFL. But I do think that there's something to say about the system that Sarkeesian ran. You got to look at what he did with Tua Tagovailoa. Ran a very similar system. They allowed him to be a little bit more effective on the run. But it was a very similar system. And Tua went five overall. And a lot of people thought he was going to be the number one pick before he injured himself. So I think that this is why we talk about Tua and maybe Mac Jones in the same conversation. Because of they're both bigger guys. One's a lefty who's more dual threat. One's more of your traditional right-handed pocket passing quarterback. But the system's working. And I think that this is what's going to lead Steve Sarkeesian to another head coaching job. If not this year, for sure next year. Next question comes from, oh God, comes from my mom, Judy. Uh, if you were to say there was one trap game left on the season for AM, who would it be? <sighs> yeah, I mean, if I had to pick right now, I'd say this game actually coming up. I would say Arkansas is a trap game because the way that Barry Odom has transformed this defense for the Razorbacks is nothing short of impressive. He continues to see them develop, they're leading the SEC. In total stop, uh, total tackles. They're leading the SEC in interceptions with 10. Don't get me wrong, they've gotten like eight in two games. So it's not like they're blowing teams out consistently, you know, two, two, two. It's it's four, it's five, it's four, it's four, it's one, it's one. Like it's one of those kind of things. But they still have 10. They have three returns for touchdowns. Two came in the Mississippi State game. So the way that the secondary is playing with a lot of veteran talent. Kellen Mond has to be very careful throwing the ball, mainly because if he's still trying to build that repertoire with these young receivers. When you look at Mississippi State, they were playing with two brand new cornerbacks. You know, Cameron Dancer was gone. Uh, the other guy, I think, transferred or graduated. He's no longer in the system. So you now have kind of a fair advantage where it's, okay, very talented wide receivers who were probably in the top 100 of their recruiting class. Playing in College Station versus three-star recruits playing the cornerback position who could be either freshmen or they were depth pieces all the way up until this year. So it makes sense that that's why a and was able to have those big-time plays, like the 54-yard touchdown to Chase Lane. This is a veteran unit. It's a little different. You have to trust that your receivers can get open, number one. And number two, they can be effective after the catch. That's something that a lot of people, I think, also don't realize when it comes down to football is how important you have to be after the catch. Because if getting a play done, yeah, you move the ball six yards. But can you move the ball 16 yards? Can you move the ball 18 yards? Can you move the ball 24 yards? What can you do when you have the momentum? It's always great to haul on a catch. It's always great to make a defender miss and get a few extra yards to keep a drive alive. We got a few more questions before we end the show today, so make sure that you stick around, and we'll be back in just a quick moment. 
Locked on Aggies presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. Cole Thompson here in the driver's seat talking all things Texas A&M. Guys, make sure you're following the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson right there below, right there, and at Locked on Aggies. It's just at Locked on Aggies. Let's go to the next question. This comes from Dale Duncan via email. Would you switch Kellen Mond if he struggles this week? No, I wouldn't. I think there's something to say about what Kellen Mond has done for the program at a respect level that you don't pull him. That doesn't mean you don't start seeing what Zach Calzada and Haynes King can do, but if one game is really going to decide what we think of Kellen Mond, which would have been the Vanderbilt game, in my opinion, because Alabama's Alabama. I'm just going to be completely honest, guys. Alabama's Alabama. It's hard to beat that defense. Even when Pete Golding is struggling as a DC, and they've put up points. I mean, AS put up points, Ole Miss put up points, Georgia's put up points, Tennessee's put up points. They still find ways to capitalize on offense and make one or two big time stops that eventually gives a uh, gives the Alabama the win. But that Vanderbilt game is the game that I think most people kind of go back to. I mean, three turnovers from Mond, four total on offense. Two coming on plays that he should have just gotten rid of the ball. Two coming on plays where it just feels like he was trying to do way too much when he couldn't. So those are just things that I look at that make me wonder, I mean, really, people continue to go back to that. Mon's improved every single game since. He played very well against Florida. He did his part trusting the run game doing their job against Mississippi State. And honestly, I think that's just what you have to do now. I think that even if he struggles in this game, if the run game is getting 230 yards and three touchdowns, that's kind of like making up for it in its own way. Because if you're seeing the run game continue to develop at a higher level, I think also you can't just throw away Mon this close to the end of his Aggie career. I think it's more of an insult on him When if you want to go this path, let him have a shot to go transfer and build his stock somewhere else for the 2022 NFL draft. That's just my personal opinion. Next question. Who's the one receiver that needs to step up this week? Um, Hezekiah Jones coming off the injury list is one that I would watch because if he hasn't been fully healthy since 2018, he missed all of last season with a lower leg injury. He missed the very beginning of this season with another injury that was undisclaimed. And now he's back in practice. In games against Arkansas, though, he's been effective. He had 13 yards, I think, in his freshman year. Oh, no, that was against Medical State. But in his sophomore year, in 2018, he had his best college game, three catches, 34 yards. Veteran talent like that, veterans that have been in the system, know what Jimbo's talking about, understand the play calling, understand what happens after after the catch, what you see when you're calling an audible, those are things that veterans just know. And Jones, even though he hasn't played a ton, I think that he's the guy who knows the most. So you have to kind of go back to him every single time. That's just my opinion. I don't know if he will be the number one guy, but he is the guy I'm going to be watching the most because of there's also that trust factor. Mon's been working with him for three years, four years really in practice because they worked together in fall camp before he got injured. If that's the case, you should be able to go, okay, I know he's going to look for me when I cut left, so get my head around, because the ball is going to be right there in about 10.10 seconds. So I would go with Ezekiel Jones. I think another name to watch for would be Demond Demas. At some point, they have to play him this year. He has to get some significant carries. He has to get some significant catches. I think this might be the game, especially if the run game does their part and they put up a big-time score at home. I think this would be a game that they easily could go out and make an impact immediately. So, yeah, I'm going to go with either Hezekiah Jones or Demond Demas getting the big game. Final question. Does A&M beat the spread? This is a good one because here's the thing. A&M has not beaten the spread since 2014. They beat it one time since 2014 when the game was in Arlington. 
The last time A&M played host to the likes of Arkansas, they beat the spread at 59-10. to But Arkansas was also a good team back then. A&M was still trying to figure themselves out in the SEC, feeling the waters. I'm just not sure. I think that this entire year has always made me pick against the spread because of what limited practices you had when the facilities closed down, when you weren't able to go in and get as, as many as much game film as you wanted, when every team was kind of playing at a fair level. I got to give a lot of credit, credit to Sam Pittman, what he's done for the Razorbacks. He's ended their SEC losing streak. He's ended their SEC home losing streak. And they're playing with a little bit of fire underneath them. If they win, they move to 3-2, and two, which would be tied with AM, which would be tied for second place in the SEC. Now, that's not to say that they're going to win the SEC West. Not at all. It is saying, though, this Arkansas team is a lot better than what we thought. And it goes down to defense, but also the offense is doing their part in a minority way. Having a franchise, uh, having a SEC quarterback transfer into the program, such as a guy like Felipe Franks, says more about what it does to Arkansas than anything else. Veterans have this presence of just understanding the cadence, understanding the calls, understanding all of that, that makes them a little bit more effective than I think other players do. I mean, even KJ Costello in the very first game against LSU looked to be a franchise quarterback at the NFL level because of what he did as a veteran against a young defense. This defense for AM is not young. They're actually more veteran than they are anything else. In fact, that's actually this team, this AM team is just a veteran talent. And if you look at the starting lineups overall, at least uh, I think it's now every starter on the offense has at least seen snaps before going into the season at some capacity, whether that be a starting role or a second team role. I think on defense going into the season, I think it was 10 players of the 11 on defense that played significant snaps. I think Jalen John, Jalen Jones was the only one who did not play a significant snap. I'm going to go. No, they don't cover the spread because of, again, it's just a weird year. It's one of those things where I look at this team. I look at the SEC in general, and maybe I'm just a little worried about always taking the over or taking the points. And when you look at the history of this program, of these two programs, it's gone to overtime three times in the last six years, I want to say. It's been decided by a touchdown or less five out of the last six years. 12 points is way too much, even though it is playing, being played at home. So I'm going to go a and does get the win, naturally, but I do think that Arkansas covers. And that says a lot about Barry Odom, who I do think will be up for a head coaching job alongside Mike Elko at a non-Power 5 school very soon, or a weaker Power 5 school, such as NC State, Georgia Tech. Um, I think maybe you could throw in like even some smaller school like West Virginia if you really want to, if Neil Brown was getting out. But that's good for this edition of Locked on Aggies. Make sure you're following us on social media, at Mr. Cole Thompson and at Locked on Aggies. On tomorrow's show, We'll be breaking down my top five players to watch for on the Razorback side, my top five players to watch for on the Aggie side, and giving my score predictions around the SEC. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. Follow us on social media. I'm Mr. Cole Thompson, Nat Locked on Aggies. We will see you tomorrow. And remember, kick him, y'all.